Okay, great stuff. Okay, so the, the title of our presentation today is Collaborative Meaning Making Participatory Arts Based Inquiry as Engaged Research. And really, I thought it would be uh, useful to start with some of the background premises of participatory research in general before we move on to the arts based approaches within this context. Um, and there have been some very useful um, comments that have been made and useful literature in terms of this particular approach. Um, and you can see some of the concepts here in some of the quotes that, that I've laid out for you. Um, the most one of the most important one obviously is collaboration. So it's a collaborative uh, approach that equitably act, equitably involves all partners in the research uh, process and recognizes the unique strengths that each brings. Uh, the research being a creative enterprise, which is really important, human uh, experience at its core and the attention to the process within this partnership. Uh, the democratic process in co-creation of knowledge and then integrating these research findings into uh, various systems and practice. Um, and the overall aim to create fairer, more sustainable and socially more connected societies uh, in the face of increasingly complex uh, challenges. Um, and that's also seen as really important where uh, citizens themselves provide some of these uh, insights and solutions to these very complex problems. Uh, I'm sure many people are aware of different models of participatory uh, research in health and social sciences areas, and some of them are uh, listed there, and you can have a look at those in, in your own time. Um, the one that we're particularly interested in today is participatory arts-based research. So just to give you a little bit of uh, background in relation to that um, and some of the definitions really. Um, it's an approach in which people collaborate in art making as a way of knowing. So here we have the collaboration piece again, but added to that then is the art making as being a very important process in sense making or meaning making. Um, it combines features of participatory action research and arts-based research. And you might say, well, what's the, what's the contribution of arts-based research here? Um, well, really, arts-based research uses this visual, dramatic or poetic practices as a, a very valid means of inquiry in themselves and also as a means of a, a, you know, providing divergent ways of interpreting and representing or representing uh, human experience. Uh, offering opp uh, uh, participants opportunities to inquire into their own life narratives and revealing insights that are beyond words um, and to be able to translate and express this tacit knowledge, which is really important in um, contexts where possibly people may have experienced trauma um, and do maybe are not able to put words onto these particular experiences. Uh, and also people uh, from marginalized groups who you know, either prefer or have uh, to use other forms of, of representing their experiences um, or have difficulties in some ways, maybe with, with literacy or, or other modes of expression. So I want to just move on to give you some examples here of, of some of the uh, participatory arts based research that I've been lucky enough to be involved in. And the first one is a collaborative inquiry between a community project for women affected by addiction and poverty, which is a SEAL project and our BSE student mental health nurses um, in TCU. And the background to that is that uh, we have had existing collaborative relationships, uh, particularly particularly between myself and the CEO of the SEAL project, uh, it was Gary Broderick. And again, we worked very closely on this particular project. Um, the, the background literature calls for meaningful uh, collaboration with service users in education and research. And also there's, uh, you know, increasing literature uh, recognizing the um, value of narrative and participatory arts based approaches um, in a whole range of contexts. Um, for this particular project, we used uh, participatory visual me uh, research methodologies uh, designed by Mitchell et al. 
Um, and in this method, uh, participants play a, an active role in both the creation and the analysis of the visual data. Um, and in this case, you can see there's a range of um, uh, types of data. There are photography, vi uh, video, et cetera. In this uh, case, we used photography. Um, and I really like what Mitchell says here about the characteristics of PVRM, uh, where uh, she sees it as a mode of inquiry, a mode of representation, a mode of dissemination and a mode of transformation. So throughout the whole research process, uh, this really kind of shows the affordances of this particular method. Um, and I think it's really important, obviously, that uh, PVRM operates uh, through this collaboration and co-production of knowledge grounded in uh, community-based research. So in relation to this particular uh, project, uh, the um, research project, the SEAL project actually kicked us off uh, by uh, asking um, people within a range of contexts, you know, in your opinion, what object represents poverty? And you can see there in that poster, the whole range of, of, of objects were put forward. Um, and these were um, exhibited in an urban art exhibition. Uh, and here you can see um, this was the International Day of Poverty when, when this uh, exhibition uh, was launched uh, on the on the keys. And uh, you can see there, you know, people putting it together, some of the service users and staff and some very important um, uh, guests uh, to, to that exhibition, uh, which created a lot of discussion. Um, okay, so we moved on from that. We extended that inquiry. Uh, myself and Gary uh, discussed this and with the team, both at SAIL and amongst our student nurses, uh, to, to, to have a more in-depth collaboration. Um, using an arts based inquiry uh, to analyze the photographs and share the stories and perceptions uh, amongst the women and student nurses concerning poverty, mental health issues and substance use. So you can see there uh, some of the very lively uh, discussions that went on at our workshops um, amongst the students and the SAIL uh, service users. Um, so and that, that took place at DCU. Um, and I'll just give you some background to the actual workshop, uh, which was very carefully planned in, in advance and discussed with uh, both the women from SAIL and also the student nurses. And prior to that workshop, you know, all the, all the participants were asked to choose one of the images that resonated with them in some way or they would like to discuss further. Um, and then they came along to DCU and we had a nice breakfast together um, and, you know, um, started conversations and uh, there was lots of discussion. Um, and then we move forward into the actual workshops and just reminding people of the purpose and the process of the workshop and the ground rules. And this followed on from, you know, previously having given uh, all the people involved the participant information sheet um, and really going through it with them in terms of what they wanted from the workshop as well. So just a reminder of that, then uh, we did the consent forms, the photography and the recording consent. Um, and people had the choice as to whether they wanted uh, to have uh, their group uh, digitally recorded or whether they like a facilitator just to make notes. Um, and so that worked out very well. Uh, the groups, uh, the bigger group was divided into smaller groups. Uh, you know, people who had selected the same or similar uh, image. And then the, the moderator uh, moderated the groups and recorded the data either digitally or by note forms. Um, and so the groups were asked to consider, you know, why did you choose this image? Why was why did this resonate with you? Uh, how how did this image impact uh, the reality or relate to the reality of poverty in Ireland? And what can be learned from this? Um, and following then that small group discussion, the participants reconvened and to the bigger group and we had a wider discussion then. And then we moved on to the review and the evaluation of that actual process. What was that like for participants? Did they find working with the image, uh, the various images? How did they find that in evoking, you know, their responses and, and helping them to inquire into experiences uh, of poverty? 
And then we move forward to some of the exhibition planning uh, amongst the group that were involved. So, um, you know, looking back to our methodology, uh, the Mitchell uh, PVRM method, uh, you can see from what I said already that in those discussion groups, uh, analysis obviously took place. Um, each image analyzed and the personal meaning and resonance were shared um, in the group, as well as some of the potential, you know, wider societal implications and perceptions. Uh, Mitchell also recommends a secondary content and thematic analysis, uh, you, you know, looking at some of the broader social constructions and discourses that might have shaped, you know, both the cr original creation of the images and also how they were discussed in the context that they were in the workshop. Um, and really, um, it was important to bear in mind that there are two groups of participants all with very differing perspectives, um, you know, whether there were the women from the SAIL project with very much lived experiences of poverty, the student nurses, you know, many of whom also experienced uh, poverty as well, but possibly with different um, uh, perspectives in, in, in that regard. Um, and so it was really uh, important to take, you know, the context of the range of people in the room into account. So finally, the emerging themes from the participant led analysis and the researcher analysis were triangulated to, and we arrived at key themes and findings, which we agreed with everyone um, in, in the process. And so you can see here the process of meaning making through the arts based methods. And I'm just using the example here of, of the sleeping bag, which is one of the uh, images. And you can see how this was dialogued within a small group and the notes that were made uh, in relation to the perceptions around the sleeping bags. Some people talked about using sleeping bags when they were sleeping rough. Other people talked about you know, the sleeping bag when they were uh, going camping or holidays, maybe as a child. Uh, so there were a whole variety of perceptions around each of the images, uh, which really give a very rich context. Um, and um, so, I mean, people talked about, um, you know, both positive and negative e experiences. Um, and this was the image of the empty plate, which was a very, uh, evoked a very poignant uh, story from one of the participants. And this was a woman who uh, was in hotel accommodation with her children. Um, and really, um, the, the image of the place, plate really resonated with her because it made her think of a time when uh, she wanted to prepare uh, potatoes in the microwave in the hotel um, and she had no fridge. Uh, and basically the milk turned sour. You can read that yourselves there. Um, and this was very uh, symbolic in the fact that she felt she wasn't, the fact that she wasn't able to create such a, what she would have seen as a very basic meal for her children um, was symbolic of her abilities at that stage as a mother and being able to parent and nurture her children. So this almost brought her to, to breaking point and, uh, you know, left her very distressed. Okay, um, now this presentation is mostly about the actual process of participatory arts based research, but I'm sure that people might be interested in the actual findings that we came up with based on the images and the discussions. Um, and just to, to briefly go through the findings then, um, the group saw uh, uh, poverty as a stigmatized yet universal experiences. Um, you know, many of the people discussing the images um, you know, had a, you often struggled with 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 poverty, um, and yet tried to uh, put themselves forward um, in the best way that they possibly could. They felt that they tried to hide the fact that they were poor and put put their best side out, so to speak. Um, and yet, many people in the room had experienced poverty at some point in their lives. Uh, you know, whether it was women from the CL project or the student nurses. Um, trying to manage um, living in Dublin, maybe they were from the countryside, maybe their, their families didn't have much money to begin with. They were now trying to pay rent, uh, feed themselves and all of that. 
We also saw that poverty was a gendered experience um, that uh, which has already come up in, in, so, uh, in that last image of the plate um, in terms of performing a desired uh, maternal role and also this vulnerability to abuse that uh, some people talked about when they're poor, they didn't have as many choices in terms of um, activities that they performed or things that they ended up getting involved in. Um, Poverty as trauma as well, especially the ongoing daily grind of, of poverty. Um, the interrelationships and the circularity between poverty, substance use and mental health difficulties. Um, and really which came first and the sort of interrelationships of, of these issues that kept people locked within this kind of vicious cycle. Um, the whole um, experience of transitory and residual poverty was also something that was quite interesting. Um, some people saw themselves as being um, temporarily uh, um, caught up in poverty, uh, but hoped that they would be moving on, whether that was that um, they would be getting uh, their degree in nursing and been able to move into a permanent kind of uh, employment uh, or or as moving on to better things, maybe getting a home uh, for some of the, the women in, in SEAL. Uh, but other people saw themselves as being, um, I suppose, enmeshed really in residual poverty and finding it very difficult to move on, particularly the women from the SEAL project um, who had a, a daily struggle with po poverty and seemed to, at times to be unending. But also there was a, um, a sense of resilience uh, on how people navigated uh, poverty and used very ingenious ways of being able to cope with undoubtedly uh, their breaking points from time to time. Um, it was very important to the group that uh, the findings were disseminated in a very collaborative way uh, where people were able to have th their voices heard. Um, so that extended to, uh, you know, quite a lot of work in the planning, staging and the delivery of the exhibition at DCU and also in the SEAL project. Um, and we uh, disseminated not just the photograph, uh, photographic exhibits, but also the kind of rich findings from the workshops. And they were placed alongside the actual photographs so people could read uh, what uh, the workshop participants had uh, thought about the um, the various exhibits um, and the actual research participants or our research partners um, from SAIL and the student nurses engaged the exhibition visitors in discussion regarding their responses to the images and exhibition themes. And you can see here, um, you know, some of the um, it, it, women from SAIL and all the, uh, the uh, other research participants getting the, um, the work together uh, for the exhibition. And here is a dissemination in, in action here where the speakers are all lined up to discuss the findings and also their experiences of actually participating in, in the research. So what were the benefits really for uh, people involved in this project? Um, well, really, um, you know, both uh, all of the participants talked about the, their sense of being able to contribute to the debate on this topic and also to the learning of student nurses um, and, and the people in SAIL. Um, and, and our arts-based approaches was a really good methodology in this regard, uh, that the images were seen as a great way to get over barriers and shyness and that everybody was able to share their opinion and contribute to this debate and the discussion through being provoked, if you like, by um, the art images or the photographic images. Um, um, so, so developing these kind of understandings as well uh, was seen as a really positive outcome of the research as well. Um, you know, there are uh, two, um, two groups, I suppose, coming together uh, who maybe wouldn't have had that much knowledge of each other's worlds prior to this research. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, notions, I suppose, each group about each other that were dismantled in this process. Um, so, so that was really powerful um, and getting to know each other's worlds a bit better. 
and you can see that in some of these quotes here, um, you know, where people from SEAL talked about, um, you know, realizing to a much greater extent that the student nurses also experienced poverty, uh, which they hadn't really thought about before. Um, um, and you can see that in the quotes, uh, you know, one of the weeks he didn't have money to fill up his shopping basket. You know, they're like every students are like every normal person, just like us. Um, and also um, the student nurses also were uh, uh, found it really interesting to work with women from the SEAL project and got to see uh, them in their worlds. And also it also destabilized some of the stereotypes that they would have had of people who use substances because here were these women um, who were still actively using and and very much able to contribute to debates and to putting their points forward. Um, so it really helps students to see that uh, the strengths that there are of people in all sorts of circumstances. Um, and uh, another really positive outcome was that um, the um, women from SEAL who had perceived the university context as, you know, very much a, as an ivory tower and with them in their context of poverty um, and maybe um, missed opportunities at times, saw the universities maybe uh, as being out of their reach. Whereas this really gave them a sense that there is a place for them within the university. They worked really hard with the students and with, with the whole team getting this whole project together. Uh, and a really positive outcome was that uh, uh, one of the women uh, resumed her studies. She had undertaken a degree um, at DCU, but had unfortunately given it up. Uh, but now she resumed her studies as a result of this project. So that was really good. So that's uh, this particular project. I've just gone into a bit of depth so that you could actually learn a little bit more about the process. Uh, there are a couple of other short uh, projects that I've just written a short a couple of short notes about uh, and I might just fly through them just in the interest of time and it's just to give you um, um, an alternative uh, view of, of, of some other studies that use possibly different type methodology uh, and the first one is um, a, uh, the adolescence embodied experiences of living with chronic disease uh, kidney disease and this was um, uh, uh, Colleen O'Neill, who uh, I supervised for her PhD project with uh, Veronica Lambert as well. Um, and this was a really interesting uh, group of participants, uh, adolescents uh, who were experiencing uh, chronic kidney disease. And when you think of adolescence and puberty, uh, I'm sure people will be well aware of, you know, some of the challenges at this phase of life where young people's bodies are changing through through puberty and, you know, finding their, trying to find their identity in lives between childhood and adulthood. Um, and this is made much more complicated and challenging when young people are experiencing chronic kidney disease uh, with all the um, difficulties that a disease process has put on their body, included stunted growth um, and a whole range of other challenges, tiredness and, um, and other symptoms. Um, and then the medical treatment that is involved um, in, in this disease, for example, uh, kidney dialysis and also um, kidney transplantation, which once again disrupts the body integrity. Um, and yet there's very little research that examines this embodied experiences and these coexisting challenges, so to speak. Um, um, so we decided that um, participatory arts based methodology would be really uh, useful for this um, in the form of body mapping, uh, which is a method that was developed by uh, Jane Solomon uh, in the context of uh, people in Africa with HIV and AIDS. Um, and it involves the creation of uh, life-size body maps where each person creates their own body map, um, defining uh, how uh, they feel within their bodies and their social contexts. 
um, and they provide rich uh, visual narratives of experience. So we thought this would be a really useful methodology for with the particular adolescents involved here um, to really help to sort of dig down into that embodied experience. And that this is the beauty as well of arts based participatory research, because we couldn't think of any other methodology by which you could actually get to this level of depth about the uh, the experience, the actual lived experiences within people's bodies of disease. Um, and indeed, this uh, particular method um, did um, result in very uh, rich findings. Uh, young people were able to um, visualize and tr translate and communicate through art um, their experiences of profound th uh, thirst and tiredness, body leakages, body disruptions and the whole colonization of the body by technology, um, hosting an alien body part in adolescence, which you know must be quite freaky um, um, in terms of transplants. Um, and these uh, the things that were never, haven't really been uh, pre previously considered or, or researched. Um, and this a manifestation, I suppose, of these experiences uh, were really powerful for the adolescents themselves, first of all, because it really helped them to work through some of the things that they are, were experiencing but weren't able to put words on. Um, and also uh, for the, there was an exhibition of the body maps in Temple Street. Um, so healthcare practitioners were able to look at these body maps and, and really understand what thirst might feel like, what the experiences of these young people was like, and it helped develop empathy and it really increased insight uh, and develop uh, really sensitive approaches to care. Um, so that was, was really valuable. And you can see here uh, one of the, the body maps and you can see how much work has actually gone into creating this body map from the young person involved. Uh, I know Colleen was working with each participant, you know, for maybe, you know, five or six um, sessions of actual artwork, asking uh, prompt questions. And you can see some of the prompt questions down the side there and some of the findings that were coming out from that. Now, they're discussed in much greater deep depth in uh, Colleen's thesis, which is on Doris, if anybody wants to have a look at that. Um, another uh, project uh, that we were involved in uh, was Love, Loss, Life. And this was with Nicola Keeley, um, who's a theatre director, and uh, a group of actors with intellectual disability who formed the Rhythm Room Theatre Company. Um, and they worked with our student nurses on, on a play that they had developed uh, in relation to um, a love and loss in the context of having an intellectual disability um, and what that was like managing and negotiating relationships, uh, romantic and platonic, uh, also relationships with family and parents, uh, loss sometimes in that context where possible bereavement uh, from parents dying or other situations where families and parents were lost. Um, and so it coming together with student nurses who were also experiencing because they're a similar age um, in love and losses in their lives as well in the context of relationships and all of that. So the original play was reconfigured and uh, incorporating uh, some of these new perceptions and themes which were workshopped, you know, with the, with the two groups uh, together coming as one group. And this was disseminated through the performance of a play at the DCU Helix. Um, and we had a post performance audience discussion of the themes. Um, and this was um, a really eye opening um, experience for everybody involved, um, this collaborative dra drama. There certainly was knowledge exchange and those development of insight uh, for all participants, you know, regarding the commonality of experiences um, throughout the group. Um, and uh, audience members and participants, families who attended uh, the the, uh, the play I also got an awful lot from it and it was a really lively uh, post-production uh, discussion. 
Um, another really positive thing that came from, from this uh, piece of participatory research was this disruption of habitual power dynamics. Uh, as nurses, um, there's often this um, very, I suppose, paternalistic uh, approach because often working with vulnerable groups, people with illness or disabilities, uh, there's a, a kind of power dynamic that develops uh, where one group is dependent on, on another. Um, and this uh, really helped to disrupt that uh, sometimes harmful dynamic where the actors were often much more in charge because they had the uh, theatre expertise and the students were quite anxious about performing. So it really usurped uh, some of the that habitual dynamic. Um, so that was that was really interesting to observe as well. And so here are some images from the, that uh, production. Um, and the, the, the production and process and also the uh, the performance itself and then the the, the uh, post uh, performance wrap party there you can see the pizza party we had at the end. Okay, so just to move on and talk about some of the challenges and opportunities of uh, participatory arts based research um, trust building is really, really important uh, in terms of developing relationships with everybody involved. It's non traditional research and requires it, you know, a deeper level of engagement uh, than customarily might be the case from participants uh, or research partners. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the, the time and the work that there's involved in establishing those partnerships. Um, often we're working with marginalised and or so-called vulnerable groups. Um, so it's really important to preserve the agency of everyone involved. There is a risk of tokenism and paternalism, um, you know, given the history of research where, you know, there's, uh, especially in more conventional research, it's, you know, the researchers and the subjects. Um, um, Ensuring, having said that, um, it's really important that people who are vulnerable or people who need supports, um, that these supports are in place, whether that's emotional or practical support or research training or whatever is needed. Um, and also the facilitator needs to be quite skilled because, you know, you're working with a group of very diverse people. Ethical considerations are hugely important, uh, especially in relation to whose voice gets heard, um, that people are working together as a partnership. Um, and even in terms of some of the terms that we use, I mean, I'm talking in this presentation about research participants, but really they're research partners. Um, and sometimes the terms we use uh, positions people as well. Uh, we need to look at research roles, uh, what our roles are occupied, what kind of rewards um, are, are, are there for, for everyone participating in, in the research. Uh, traditionally, that tends to be academic papers, uh, all of that. But in these kind of contexts where it's much more uh, devolved, if you like, uh, people may not see academic uh, papers as being appropriate to them you know, whether they have other preferred ways of disseminating, disseminating research um, or they have maybe literacy difficulties or whatever. So a very democratic uh, process of uh, dissemination needs to be involved. Um, whose voice gets heard is, is, is hugely important, especially in the uh, context of marginalised groups. Uh, we talk in uh, ethics around uh, informed consent, anonymity, GTBR, um, confidentiality, all of that. Uh, but in this research, if we're looking at uh, people as equal research partners, many people want their voices to be heard. They want to be identified within the, the research. They want to own their own perceptions so uh, and have these out in the public domain. So we need to think about, you know, what what ways can we work with ethic committees um, and the whole ethical care of participants um, so that so that the, these are accommodated within the research. Um, need to have flexibility in scheduling and making the most of time together. And then some methodological considerations here as well, uh, developing theoretical and pra practice frameworks um, so that best practice can be achieved in uh, participatory arts-based research. 
Um, I've already mentioned about dissemination there, so I won't labour that point anymore. Um, also then achieving uh, resources for uh, PABR and the recognition of, of the value of uh, PABR, uh, you know, across the academy um, and, uh, and in community contexts as well, um, as a very powerful method of knowledge gener generation and achieving collaborative understandings and actually developing uh, this evidence base. Um, so just uh, really to conclude in terms of the uh, implications for uh, engaged research practice here and what would we recommend uh, from a participatory arts based perspective. Uh, well, we think it's essential to have ongoing dialogue and collaboration with a whole range of people who are invested in developing this engaged research and in participatory uh, arts based approaches in particular. And we need to use these collaborative practices that ensure equality of engagement opportunities and voice that widen perspectives, combat stigma and stigma among researchers as well. Um, develop well-informed, effective practice. And just finally, um, participatory arts-based approaches offer powerful methods of engaging diverse groups, exploring perceptions and facilitating, facilitating sharing of experiences. This grassroots dialogue and collaboration is fundamental for developing sensitive, creative, socially engaged research practice and knowledge development. Um, so that concludes um, our presentation today. Um, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you find uh, some of that uh, uh, useful or interesting for you in your practice. Uh, and I wish you all the best. Uh, please do feel free to contact me if you uh, want to talk any more about it or uh, dialogue further. It's uh, bridge, B-R-I-E-G-E dot K-C-C-A-S-E-Y at D-C-U dot I-E. Okay, thank you very much. All the best. Yeah, that was that was excellent, Breach. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, and the video worked perfectly. Uh, now, what's going on here? Now, uh, I've, I've put a message into the chat box there but, uh, as we were coming to a close of the presentation. But I just want to reiterate uh, that. Oh, are we going again here, Breach? No. Uh, if you'd like to stop sharing and then you can uh, come back onto the screen yourself. Um, so just to reiterate, we have a short uh, Q&A Q session now, but also as well as questions, feel free to um, share some of your own experiences or points of view or just uh, make a comment uh, if you wish. So the floor is open now, as well as the chat box, if anyone has any questions or things they'd like to share. <clears throat> I do have a few questions myself, but I always like to open up the floor first before I take over, because I don't want to speak too much. Um, Francis Ward has asked, are there any examples of the use of music uh, in PABR? Um, do you have anything to share yeah. about that bridge? Yeah, okay. Yes, absolutely, uh, Francis. Um, there's been some uh, really interesting uh, work done, especially maybe in relation to um, choirs, maybe with people with dementia, in terms of um, how they use music and the uh, participating in music generation um, and also um, using music as reminiscence. It's bordering a little bit on therapy as well, but using music to kind of provoke uh, people's maybe memories or sensations uh, and then working with them to kind of record that or even creating poets, poetry out of that um, as well. So there are uh, quite a few examples of, of all the art forms. Um, I, can, I can send you some of those if you like. Um, but yes, uh, music and music within the community as well, um, in terms of music making groups from various marginalized communities, um, sharing their own culture of music and what that actually means to them as well. Composing different things or performing um, and having responses then from audiences as well. So, yes, absolutely.
Okay, so there's a question from Jackie there. In the first studies, study, are there participants involved in the study design phase or just uh, from stating uh, or starting or creating the objects? Um, they were involved initially, yes, uh, Jackie, they um, developed the, uh, uh, the photographs themselves. They carried out their own piece of research, which was great in asking uh, people, members from the general public, you know, what did they think of uh, when they thought of poverty? They, they Those participants in sale didn't particularly conceive of that as research. They just wanted to find this out and they thought it'd be a really nice project uh, to get the, the, the photographs then developed. One of the volunteers was an actual photographer. Um, so th th they did that and then they thought that the urban exhibition would be the end of it. Um, but I, I was involved with SAIL and so I, I spoke to them and said, look, this could be really interesting to actually explore this further and in a learning context. So we did talk with uh, the women in SAIL and also with our student nurses as to how we could, you know, what could be the plan for them to get getting together. Um, and with the staff from both areas as well. So, yes, they were very much involved in that design of, of what that would look like. And then moving forward, uh, you know, what they wanted to see in the workshops, what sort of things they would like to do. And then again, moving forward then into the dissemination uh, of the research as well. Uh, so, yes, they were involved um, in, in that. Excellent. Sorry, I I began reading that out and realised I was on mute. Ah, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no worries. Okay, no, excellent. Are there any other uh, questions? I did the uh, Ashling Silk uh, Silk. Did the participants take the photographs uh, in the project you mentioned, Breach? Okay. Yeah. Um, they no, they didn't actually take the photographs. It was uh, one of the volunteers in the Seal project or one of the staff members actually, who, you know, was a professional photographer, uh, which was, which was great for, uh, to have, have it. But, but what the women did was they were uh, involved in asking the questions, uh, interviewing people or just asking people on the street, doing like a vox pop, uh, saying to them, you know, when you think of poverty, what image comes to mind? And people might say, oh, a sleeping bag or uh, a needle or an empty plate or a shopping trolley. So then they made notes of what people said. They brought it back to sale. And the most popular uh, images, I suppose, that were identified, then th they made the decision, right, let's let's get photographs of these. So uh, Ray is the name of the per person who was um, taking the photographs. So the women, you know, participated in the, you know, kind of getting the photographs together and they were, they knew the photographs very intimately because they had them printed out on big uh, cardboard and they fitted into like, you know, the bread fan type trays that you might have seen in olden days. And so they're very innovative. They used that then as a, the background so they could go out in all weathers. Um, so they were very much involved in, in, in uh, you know, kind of erecting the exhibitions in the different places and answering the questions around the photographs. Um, so, yeah, so it was a mixture, but they didn't actually physically take the photographs. OK, excellent. Um, did the women did the ask, women... Oh, you go ahead. Deborah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, did the women ask the general public or concentrate on those experiencing poverty? Um, yeah, uh, the women asked a range of people, uh, like even their own relatives, other people maybe that were in poverty, um, through a, a load of different social classes, like people on the street, uh, you know, that would be walking up and down maybe Amian Street, where the project is based, um, and, a, a, you know, a range from different social classes as well. So, uh, yes, they, it, it was it was a, a, a range of people, both those actually experiencing poverty and people who uh, may have had been in poverty in, at different times in their lives uh, or maybe have worked with people in poverty. So it was a range of people. Excellent. Um, yeah, you're very welcome, Ashling. Uh, can I actually ask you a question? Uh, and this is probably more on the kind of 
getting this type of research kind of uh, getting it going i know you have, you're qualified uh, in nursing but you also have a background uh in modern art if i'm not mistaken so i was just wondering in terms of for maybe early researchers or people who maybe don't have that uh, qualification or experience in art um do you like when you're when you're doing these projects do you always have maybe a partner or a volunteer or someone to help you in that kind of uh, getting it going in that art space or do you have any recommendations or kind of tips on how you could maybe get one of these practices off the ground when maybe you don't have the art background mm. um, yeah could you say anything to that bridge Yes, certainly. I, I can indeed look. And I would hate for people to be put off, you know, if they don't have an arts background. I mean, I have a bit of an arts background. I did an arts degree at, at one point many moons ago. Um, but really, it's about collaboration and it's about, um, I mean, I work with student nurses anyway, um, with an arts and health module, and I would carry out creative um, you know, kind of sessions with them. Um, that's that's one thing. But most of that uh, collaborative participatory arts based research, I wouldn't have necessarily needed to have a load of arts experience um, because it, the, the key is to connect in with people who do have that experience and are interested in, in working. I mean, you, you can see there that especially the Rhythm Room project um, that was uh, with the theatre director. Uh, and I've worked with other, uh, you know, community theatre. All you need is uh, to know somebody and for them to be prepared to work with you. Um, I, and we, they love a lot of arts practitioners. And yes, they have the arts thing, but they want to find ways of getting their work disseminated, both through those public um dissemination but also through articles and we have written um articles in relation to this work as well but i just wanted to profile today you know this kind of public dissemination of the work um and people you know as, as participants can be involved in the academic side if they want to as well but i would say hook up with with uh, arts based practitioners because they they want to their work to have a lot of credibility within academic circles as well. And they welcome working, uh, you know, with academics. You just need to have like a really interesting uh, research questions that that have germinated, if you like, from a community um, context and, and are very, um, you know, a, irrelevant, I suppose, and uh, come from a grassroots. And you have a group of people that want to collaborate and work together. Um, but the amount of time that you need to spend with people is really, really important. That's the most important thing. Um, again, in that trust, um, you know, meeting with them maybe quite a few times, really, you know, kind of finding out what it is um, that they want to do. So that's really important. Um, so that we have Ashton here asking again, did you experience any difficulty? Yes, and, and increasingly so. Uh, and it's it's one of the downsides, I, I have to say, in terms of uh, doing this research. I know when I used to do this research uh, at the beginning, uh, not so much difficulties, not not as, as much. But but these days, and I hate to sound pessimistic, but there is, I think sometimes we're becoming so much more paternalistic and risk averse um, in ethics committees. Um, and I think some of the bureaucracy that we get tied up in, um, I know of obviously it's really important uh, to have ethical care of people, uh, um, anonymity, confidentiality, as I mentioned earlier on, and um, GDPR, that is hugely important. And especially these days, there's, there's no doubt about that. But sometimes, we actually end up stifling the voices that we that we say we want to help to bring forward. Um, you know, there's no place for um, somebody who says, I don't want um, I don't want to be anonymized in the study. I actually want you to say, no, this is Joe Bloggs here saying this. Uh, and this is what I want It's my right to be able. I'm a, I'm a person who's in a vulnerable group. That doesn't mean I'm going to fall apart if somebody asks me kind of difficult questions and writes down what it is that I feel or uh, my experience of things. So I think sometimes we, we've gone too much the other way um, um, in turn. I feel quite strongly about that. I think it's, it's really important for us to to think. And that's, that to me is, yes, absolutely a big challenge. Um, 
So you have to be fairly thick skinned and, I, you know, act as an advocate sometimes uh, in this context. Yeah. Right. We are coming up. To, well, actually, we've gone past time. But if oh, we have dear. any very last minute questions or points anyone would like to share, uh, if not, we will bring this to a close if that is OK. Mm -hmm. uh, Please feel free to contact me if anybody uh, wants uh, they have other examples of um, this kind of work uh, and narrative work. I'm happy to talk to anybody anytime. Um, so uh, thank you. Oh, here we go. Have you any hints when approaching the ethics application? You have to be very careful with your wording, um, you know, because you want to leave enough scope that you can do what you want to do, which is ethical. I think we maintain such a strong sense of ethics when you're working with people it's like in these situations it's inevitable that you are going to be ethical um um and more so even than what an ethics committee would ask you to be because you're working with human beings um but yes you have to be able to couch in, in, um language in particular ways that that tick boxes, but yet leave you scope. I mean, as you know, I can talk to you more about that. If that's any help in the future, please do feel free to, because I could do another session on that even. Um, so yes, do do get in touch and I'm happy to Zoom or whatever. Okay, right, get in touch oh, actually. Excellent. Some networking is happening. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I will have to bring this to a close. Thank you very okay. much, everyone, for coming. Happy and Christmas, thank you, Bridge. Everybody. Yes. Okay. Merry, Hi, Susan. Merry Christmas. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Bridge. And I will see Thanks, you all Bridge. in the new year. Okay. All the best, folks. Happy Christmas. You too, Bridge. Bye bye. Okay. okay. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye bye. <laughs>